Lads, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the American top tier lineup. Everything from batter rating 9.3 and upwards is what I consider to be top tier-ish. This is going to be more of a casual video. I'm going to have some footage in the background, but a lot of it is just going to be me in the hangar having a little bit of a discussion. We're going to be talking about whether the American top tier lineup is good, whether it's in the meta, or whether it's not really as good as it was used to be. Anyway, so to start, we're going to look at the MBT-70. I wouldn't recommend this vehicle anymore. It got nerfed recently. I can't remember what exactly they did to nerf it. I think they reduced the power as well as something to do with the... They made the gun weaker with the recent changes in the penetration values. So a tank that was already pretty dead in the current meta is now even worse. The only really redeeming factor about this vehicle is the fact that it is... It goes well with the XM1 because it is 9.3 as well. Also has that nice 20 mm cannon on the top, as well as this cool Deathstock camo that I have. But apart from that, it's nowhere near as good as it used to be. We then have the M3A3 Bradley. This was one of the best infantry fighting vehicles in the game when it was released. But because the the recent nerf to the Toe 2Bs, it's not as powerful as it used to be anymore. You can't simply one-shot kill any T-72 variant, which you used to be able to do when this thing first went came into the game. You do have a pretty decent 25mm chain gun though, not the highest penetration in the world. We do also have an auto tracker for the tank which allows you to engage helicopters and flying jets. Not the best anti-aircraft vehicle in the game though. And at 9.3, it's not really worth taking along. There are some vehicles like the Russian BMP-2M, that's 9.3 and you can, you can use that at 11.7 and it will still be very very powerful. Can't really say that about the Bradley, in my opinion. We then also have the LAVAD. This is the air defense variant of the, I believe it's, I can't remember if it's American or a Canadian chassis. One of the two, anyway. I think it's a marine car vehicle. Basically, a 25mm revolving cannon with your choice between Stinger missiles or Hydra rocket pods. This is actually a pretty decent vehicle, to be honest. It's quite flexible. There isn't really any other. No other nation really has a vehicle similar to this. It's got high speed so you can flank with it. The 25mm gun does make it pretty effective against helicopters, not so much against planes. The stingers are alright but they're quite limited in the frontal aspect engagement zone. They're not really that useful against helicopters especially. And the, the hydro rockets can be useful to be honest. Overall though I don't really take the LAVAD into my top tier lineup. It's not I think the ADATS just does everything a little bit better than it, to be honest. Apart from, you know, the whole being incredibly mobile thing. But we have the M1 Abrams. That is a tank that is incredibly well known for its mobility. So not taking along the LAVD, LAVAD. You're not really lacking mobility at top tier with the Americans. The XM1 is one of the oldest rank 6 premiums in War Thunder. And while it is nowhere near as powerful now as it used to be. It's still a fairly mobile tank. You can basically, it's basically powerful because of how fast it is. Not really due to its gun performance or its armor or survivability. Both of those aspects are a little bit bad. The tank's got, it's not got any armor to speak of really. It's got spaced armor, I believe, in the turret cheeks. Oh, it's got a bit of composite as well, actually. And the spaced armor is on the hull. I apologize. The round as well, M73, M735, it's not very good at all, really. It doesn't have that good spawning and because it's battery rated 9.3 you do get dragged up quite a lot to 9.7 and 10.0 meta. The wolf pack on the other hand, it gets the M833 round, the same round that's found in the M1 IP I believe. It's an upgraded round, it's very very strong. At 9.7 it's alright but we are a wheeled gun chassis. We aren't a tank so we don't have that high survivability. We also don't have that high mobility on soft terrain. While the M1128 Wolfpack, it is quite fast on paved road like what we're on now. But it just, it's not really that mobile on soft terrain, which is the majority of the terrain that you'll find in War Thunder. If we now take a jump up to rank 7, we also have the M1128, the Tech Tree version. This is basically the same as the Wolfpack, except we have a the M900 round. This basically gives you a substantial amount more penetration as well as a lot more post-penetration damage compared to the premium vehicle. 
apart from that, there isn't too much difference about it. It's got the same play style, same weaknesses, and the same strengths. It's basically a glass cannon. It's got a very powerful gun, up improved with that M900 round. But it basically plays the exact same way. I don't tend to take this in my lineup, to be honest. While it, it's, it's just because it's a one-trick pony. You've got high penetration and not really anything else. But then go on to the HSTVL. This is a very small, very, well, it's fairly fast, to be honest. It's just let down by its gun. So it's got an auto-loading 75mm cannon with the XM885 round. If you ever watched any of Spookson's videos, he talks at great length about how this round isn't modelled correctly and how it should have better penetration. I think this tank also should have an anti-aircraft proxy round as well, I believe, which would really help this vehicle out. Anyway, the main weakness of the HSTVL is its lack of post-pen damage. While it is mobile, there isn't a huge difference in its mobility compared to regular main battle tanks. It's not like lower tier light tanks where they can get to a cat circle uh, like half the time it takes a contemporary heavy tank. At top tier, most vehicles are going to have generally high mobility. Regardless though, I do have the HSTVL in my lineup, so it obviously is quite useful so i wouldn't take it along i use this tank not so much as a first spawn because you really want that armored fist at the start of a match to punch through the enemy's defense hstvl is good in the mid to late game where people are already injured and you can kind of get away with a dodgy shot now and then you can use that mobility to to go to uh, use though and try and get in it's more of a tank for more urban maps we can get quite close to the enemy and engage them at short ranges it's it's basically the complete concept basically the complete opposite of the m1128 that thing you want to stay quite far away and basically snipe from a distance a hstvl is up in your face it's like a drunk english person whose team's just lost the football so want to scream at you and throw a bottle at your head that's what the hstvl is like Another event vehicle that we have in the 7th rank is the M60 AMBT. This is a modernization of an M60 that was done by a Turkish company, I believe. It's got the same 105mm gun as an M60, although they modernized the fire control systems and gave it thermal imaging, as well as the KEW APFSDS round. Pretty powerful with only five with over 580mm of penetration. It's a pretty decent tank, I'm not going to lie. It is very expensive to buy on the, gu the Gaijin marketplace at the minute. So if you don't have this already, you're probably never going to get it. It's pretty good in a 9.7 lineup, but at top tier, I guess if that's all you've got, it can work. It's got that very good gun. Your armor is laughable though, and your mobility is awful. It's an M60. Me on a pushback's faster, basically. Like I said, it's, it's usable, but I don't take it at top tier. Alright, so moving on to the bread and butter of the American tech tree, we have the M1 Abrams. Just a quick note about all of the Abrams tanks in general. They have two major weak spots from the front. We have the lower frontal plate here. It's quite flat and it's very easy to go through. And we have our driver right behind it, which basically allows you to kill all of the crew member in here. The other weak spot is this turret thing here. You see that we have a major weak spot just underneath, well, just above the driver's hatch. There's no armor here and the turret ring is showing. Obviously, at longer ranges where you can't really see that, it's going to be a very hard shot to hit. But at close ranges, which is quite common in War Thunder, an enemy can just shoot you right here, as well as basically the turret breach and knock you. Either knock out your turret ring, which prevents you from getting an accurate shot, or knock out your gun in general. Many people think that the M1 Abrams entered service with the 120, but in fact, the very first Abrams, the M1, actually features the 105 gun, the British L7. This was because America wanted to keep parts commonality between the Abrams and the M60s, but when the M60s were taken out of service, the M1 Abrams were upgraded to the M1A1 with the 120 L44. The M1 Abrams is very fast though, it's a 55 ton tank with a 1500 horsepower engine. So it's got a little bit better mobility when it... Its mobility is slightly better than the T80U I believe. So it is a very nippy tank and it can be used to good success on the battlefield. This Abrams has the Elm 774 round. It's pretty decent, nearly 400mm of penetration. At 10.0 you can't really complain. It's kind of like an XM1 at 10.0 with a lot better mobility and a better gun. 
as well as better survivability. We then have the IP1 or the Improved Protection M1. This has a better gun to begin with. It has the M900 round, or well, it has better ammunition, sorry. This gives us 522 millimeters of penetration at point blank range. And it does deal with one of the weak spots of the M1 Abrams, which does have pretty mediocre gun performance, especially at top tier. The IPM1 also features slightly better armor protection. I think the turret front's a little bit thicker as well as some other aspects like that. We then have the first 120mm M1 Abrams. This is the M1A1. This is basically an M1 Abrams with the 120mm gun. It's the next Abrams we have is the M1A1HC. This basically gives you the same improved protection that we found on the IPM1, but it gives us it on the M1A1 designation basically. So we have the armor protection upgrades as well as the better 120mm gun. The, the version that we have in game also features a doser blade as well as an electro optical dazzler which isn't really that useful to be honest and is a little bit of a gimmick. We also have the M29A1 round, the same round that we found on the M1A1. This gives us nearly 600mm of penetration and is much better than either of the ammunition that we could get on the 105 variants of the Abrams. We also have an Australian M1A1, this is the AIM. It features the same ammunition that's found on the M60 A and BT, the Turkish tank we spoke about earlier. With over, well, just under 600mm of penetration, it's certainly a good round. This tank also features second generation thermal imaging for the gunner, but lacks a commander's independent thermal viewer. The Australian Abrams is a squadron vehicle, and it is one of the better Abrams tanks in the game. We then have the first of the big boys, the M1A2 Abrams. This tank features a commander's independent thermal viewer, as well as first generation thermals for the gunner and driver, uh, gunner and commander, sorry. This is the first tank to get the M29A2 round, which bumps up our penetration to 629 millimeters. The tank also received a better armor profile on its main turret, further increasing the survivability of the Abrams. And then finally, we have the M1A2 SEP. This is the most modern version of the Abrams that we have in game and basically features a, it's basically an improved survivability package for urban combat. I believe it's the Tusk kit, tactical urban survival kit. After the war on terror in the Middle East, this was the major lessons learned. It's basically just additional protection for the crew members as well as side armor for defeating RPG-7s and that sort of stuff. This adds quite a lot of weight to the vehicle, about 5 tons in fact, which does lower its general mobility. And that is a common trend that we'll find with the M1 Abrams. The most mobile Abrams tank is the 10.0 M1, and each time you upgrade up to a newer, more modern Abrams variant, the heavier and heavier the tank gets which means the tank's mobility goes down and down. This is quite a stark contrast to something like the Soviet tanks, which generally get faster and faster. So you start with like the T-72Bs, which are pretty slow, and then you move up to the T-80s and the T-80B VMs. In general though, the M1A2 Abrams, it is still mobile, but it, it is very chunky. It, it does feel quite sluggish. And while it probably is the best Abrams variant in the game, the M1A1 is still pretty much my go-to when it comes to mobility. When I want to get around the map quickly, the M1A1 is my go-to. The M1A1 AIM is also pretty decent. I still use it at top tier. It's just got such a good round and second generation thermals. That is also the other iconic, well not iconic, the other unique thing about the M1A2 SEP. It does get second generation thermals now for its gunner. Alright, so we've almost covered everything for our tanks. We now have the air defense vehicles. Well, first we have the XM975. This is basically a Roland 3 on an American chassis. We then also have the ADATs, which I don't think actually entered service whatsoever. This features a dual purpose missile. It can be used against planes as well as enemy tanks. It has 900mm of penetration. And it has a fairly fast missile travel speed of 1027 meters per second. It also features the same 25mm chain gun as found on the M3A3 Bradley, 
which does give it some flexibility when it comes to engaging both planes, helicopters and tanks. The ADATs however can only carry 8 rounds of um, anti-aircraft missiles into battle and once those are fired you cannot replenish them apart from on a cap circle. This means you are quite limited when you come to engaging both tanks and planes as you only have 8 missiles and your 25mm gun can't really be used to kill an enemy from the front unless it is a light tank. Overall the ADATS is outcompeted by something like the Pansir and the Tunguska in my opinion and while the ADATS is still lethal it's a little bit behind now when it comes to the Soviet and the German counterparts. The missile speed is a lot slower than the German Flarak Rad, whatever it's called. Alright, so that's our ground vehicles. Now let's go on to CAS. Starting with the A-10As, these vehicles can be used for closer support. However, they are subsonic and you will get down, shot down incredibly fit, quickly. The same thing goes for the A-7's cru Corsair. Sorry, buddy, I can't speak today. The A7 Corsairs, both the D and the E models, they're very good ground strike aircraft, but they are very slow and you will get shot down very quickly. If you're just, if you're like, if you're in the seventh rank of the American Air Tree, a underlooked cast aircraft is actually the A4E Phantom. This used to be the best jet in the game for dogfighting. Now it kind of gets clubbed around a bit, but a lot many people know that you can actually take four GBU-8s with the A4E. These are 2,000 pound bombs which are TV guided and they are basically guaranteed kills on an urban map. This is a very good cast jet. It's supersonic with flurs and chaff. It's not as modern as like the F-16 but it can still be used if you don't quite have the rank 8 American jets unlocked. The F-5E is also pretty decent however I do think it does get AGM-65s so yeah. It's, it's not the best but it can be used in a pinch. The F-14 can't really be used for cast, it doesn't have any type of guarded weapons whatsoever. It can carry 2,000 pound bombs but that isn't really that useful in my opinion. Same thing for the F-16 ADF, this thing is a pure air defence fighter, hence the name, and is incapable of carrying ground to air ordnance. The F-16A though is also pretty decent, like the F-4E it can carry the GBU-8s as well as the AGM-65s. However it can still only carry the AGM-65Bs which doesn't allow you to target tanks in all weather conditions. Unlike the F-4E though, in the F-16A you can take out 4 GBU-8s as well as 4 AM-9L missiles, giving you both an air to ground and air to air loadout, whereas the F-4E can only take 4 GBU-8s and no missiles in that loadout role, and both planes have a 20mm Gatling gun. Both of the rank 6 or rank 7 premiums for the Americans are also pretty well not that good to be honest. The A6E Tram is the same as the A7E and D's. It's got a lot of good weapon loads but it's subsonic and very slow. The F4S which is the newer premium it actually doesn't really have many ground strike well it has no guided weapons. It's got dumb bombs and rockets. I wouldn't recommend the F4S Phantom as a cast yet. It's just not very good. If you want to carry out casts, I'd recommend the F4E or the F16A. And finally for this video, we're going to go over the American helicopters. And we have two standout choices. We have the AH-1Z as well as the AH-64D. Both helicopters use identical weaponry really. They have the Hellfire missiles as well as the AIM-9Ls as well as the Stinger missiles I believe. The Apache tends to carry the Stingers, whereas the AH-1Z, the Viper, has the AIM-9Ls. This means the Apache can take 4 air to air missiles, whereas the Viper takes 2 air to air missiles, but the AIM-9Ls are generally considered to be the better missile. The main selling point of the American helicopters is their ability to carry 16 Hellfire missiles. Most other helicopters in the game can only carry between 8 to 12 of the air to ground weapon loadout. So the American helicopter cast can carry quite a lot of weapons into battle. The downside is though that they are using the Hellfire or the AGM-114Ks. While in real life these are very good, in War Thunder the travel time is quite slow especially compared to the Soviet helicopters. The Hellfire missile tra travels basically, it has a lofting trajectory so it takes off, it climbs high into the sky and then come down on the top of an enemy tank. 
While this does deal more damage, it means that the travel time of that missile is a very high amount of seconds. It gives the enemy a very long time to get into cover. And the Hellfire in game is generally considered to be not the best uh, to ground weapon. For comparison, the Soviet helicopters use the Vikia missile or the attacker. These missiles are much faster in terms of travel speed than the Hellfire and they travel directly towards a target or a com manual command line of sight, Saklos. This means the Russian missiles get to the targets much faster than the American missiles, generally giving both air defense and enemy players less time to react. This is why Soviet helicopters are widely considered overpowered. It's not that the helicopters themselves are overpowered, it's just that the missiles they fire have just have a much better meta compared to the Hellfire. Comparing both the Apache and the AH-1Z though, I'd go with the Apache. It's a lot, it's just a little bit more stable in my opinion. There isn't really that much difference between them to be honest. With the exception that the AH-1Z can only fire the AGM, it can only fire the Hellfire Mark Bs, it can't fire the Ks. It's just 100mm less penetration to be honest. I would go down the Apache line though, it's better in general. The 30mm gun's better in my opinion. It also looks much cooler. Alright then boys, so to conclude, the American tank meta is not as good as it used to be. While the Abrams are very fast, they get high, they get heavier and heavier the, the more modern variant you get. The armor protection, while it does get thicker in places, like the Challenger 2s, they've basically just got massive weak spots at the front of the vehicle. While the Leopards and the T-80s and T-72s still do have frontal weak spots, they are much smaller and much more fiddly to get an accurate target on. Whereas the M1 Abrams you can basically just shoot underneath the turret and you are guaranteed to go through that. The American Tech Tree also has a distinct lack of light tanks at top tier, apart from the event vehicles which not many people actually have access to. While the HSTVL and the M3 Bradley are fairly good vehicles, they have no tanks like the BMP-2 or the BMP-3 or something like the strf 9040s American General is just lacking decent support vehicles. In general though, I believe that the American tech tree isn't as good as either Germany or Russia. American tanks now aren't really that unique. Other nations vehicles do everything better in my opinion. The T-80B VM is faster, better protected and has equal firepower in my opinion. It's also in a much smaller, faster profile. Also has better thermal imaging. Regardless of this though, the Americans are still one of the big three in War Thunder. America, Germany and Russia are the three big players in the game at the minute and always have been to be honest. And from what I can see, there's not got, that isn't going to change anytime soon. While the American tanks aren't the best, they are generally still competitive with Soviet and German tanks. But I certainly would not say that the Americans are as good as those two. I think the Soviets and the Germans are tied for the top at the minute, and the American tech tree is a very clear and well-defined third place. Anyway lads, I hope you got something out of this video. It wasn't really very formal, a lot just kept me casual talking and uh, basically just finished a lot of... I've been building around my house, I'm just really, really tired, so hopefully this video is alright guys. Hopefully you do enjoy it and want to see a bit more like this. I'll get back to my regular video reviews soon. As always, big thank you to my YouTube members. And as always, thank you very much for watching.